evening and welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. Terry and Jimmy Brown. Jimmy is the the drummer, the only drummer of UB40. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing doing good. Been enjoying your music for most of my life. Um, and, and the great thing about your music and the band is it's not you not just music. You're like you're like a vibe. The UB40 is just a vibe. <laughs> it's like a soundtrack to, uh, yeah. to, to yeah. you, you know. Yeah, You're... I think we're, um, you know, there's a lot of bands that sort of like were, were with us in the 80s and uh, that kind of stopped after a while, but we kind of kept on going. But I think because we play reggae, it doesn't really pigeonhole us to the 80s, mm -hmm. you know, because it's a it's kind of an international sound and it's still, I think we've still got a kind of freshness. So, uh, yeah, we, we tend not to do nostalgic Sort of her, uh, heritage things, which I'd still make our own records and and play, you know, new tra new tracks live, rather yeah. than just end up as a cabaret. Yeah. Well, it is, and, and you you clearly it's funny for Ben. It's been as big as you've been, and had just such success. What like over a hundred million albums or something, and it's forty five years. It's forty five years. I mean, hits galore. We're celebrating our yeah, 45th, but you guys have. Yeah. Yeah, you guys have still. I mean, and it's not always been easy. You guys have had to struggle. You always had to keep working to stay where you're at. You know, you know, change and growth, and 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 writing original music, touring, obviously, mm -hmm. band members, and and awful, awful. This past year during COVID, we've had some health issues. Mm -hmm. Lost two former members, and, and uh, uh, Duncan with his, his stroke. I mean, mortality is creeping up on top of you guys too. I mean, all of oh, us. Oh, yeah, well, you know. But you guys are performers. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think to some degree, I mean, being the drummer, I think it keeps me kind of trim, keeps me in shape, which is which really helps. Do. But yeah, you know, I've, I've, uh, it, it's a beautiful life, what can I say? It's so much better than working for a living. That, uh, <laughs> we pinch ourselves every day and just thank whoever, you know, Jehovah, whoever, for... Um, yeah. For the luck that we've had, you know, we're just incredibly lucky. Well, I, I, I like the fact, and, and I think it's unfortunate, there's always been that the dispute between the names. But to me, and and nothing against uh, the other guys, but to me, you before he's always been a band. A lot of people in the band, mm -hmm. been a big band, but it always feels mm -hmm. like it's bigger. It, and the only time it gets weird is when the band splits and has the singer, because the singer is kind of the voice of a band. But UB40 is kind of his own sound to begin with. And there's so much more musicians in the band. So it gets kind of weird to say, you know, to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I want to make one thing clear is there was, there's yeah. not really a split in the band. I mean, Ali, Alex, ex singer, he's with another band, which right. has nothing to do with UB40, even though he bills himself as UB40 right. featuring. There are no real mus musicians from UB40. And in the end, you know, with we're, we're the core original band and we're the ones that have written our original songs even though we're, we're known for covers but we've still done 20 something albums of our own material that you know that, that we put out to the fans and uh yeah you know we're and we're live you know we play live we've been playing together for 45 years we know each other instinctively we like each other which makes a big change when it comes to Bands, you know, I think yeah. sometimes they can be some fallout with each other, you know, and um, and I think I kind of think that you know, you're, if you're a success, then stick with it, you know. I mean, you should you shouldn't be so blasé about right. it that you want to have arguments with each other over over bands, you know. So we like each other genuinely, and we like working together. Well, I, I think that's what happened. I think what when if if they did want to be in the band, they, they already moved on. So at that point. Everybody who was in the band wanted to be there, so it really took anything off the chest of anybody. So let's talk now. You guys are in your forty-fifth uh, celebration tour, and you got actually what Albert Hall coming up, and you had two actually big gigs coming up to start. Let's talk about those because I want people to come out and check you guys out. I mean, you guys are sounding as good as ever. You got some new albums recently sound great. I mean, you guys are not slowing down. Um, you have a new singer. No. He sounds great. Yeah. New to you guys, rather, yeah. not new to the singing world, but he stepped in perfectly, you know, Duncan spot vocally. Um, 
you guys are missing a beat. Pardon the pun. <laughs> yeah, because because we know we're we're the bands, we're the ones that have right. created the sound. The sound you hear is the sound of four of us. Those well, there's four of us now, but there was six of us. Uh, those six people get in a room, and this is the sound they produce. You know, that's uh, it's the chemistry thing. Um, and we're still doing it. We're still making that sound. And, uh, you know, we, we've we always had other singers. You know, we've always had Norman, our percussionist. He's always done a couple of numbers on a live gig. Our bass player, he does a few numbers. Uh, there was Astro, who obviously is not with us anymore. He did a few numbers. You know, yeah. it was never just down one person to, to, um, to do the front singing. You know, obviously, mostly. Ali, and it's mostly the new guy who happens to be our percussionist's uh, nephew. So oh, really? Keeping in the family, you know. Well, yeah, that works out really well. I mean, it worked out well the first time when you had Duncan come in, and then it sounded really good. So you kind of now the new singer, kind of keeping him in the in the in the family. That's pretty cool, actually. Now, you guys were actually. Mm -hmm. How often are you playing now as a drummer? It always amazes me at this point in your career. How often do you play for pleasure? Like, are you practicing when the band's not doing anything? Are you are you how are you keeping your shops up? Are you just, are you the guy that puts your stuff down when you're not playing and being like, I'll pick it up in a couple of months, I'm on break. Like, how, how are you doing that? Yeah, that, that's kind of, that's kind really? of me. That, yeah, I mean, I don't, I mean, part, part of it, it's because it's a feeling of ensemble playing. I can sit there and twiddle all day, you know, doing exercises or whatever. Yeah. But it's not going to really give you any grounding in playing with your fellow musicians, you know, and that's, right what I want to do. At the moment, we're, we've, we've got six or seven days of rehearsal before the next show. So we're working pretty hard. Um, we like to rehearse. We like to make sure that we everybody knows what they're doing before they go on stage, you know. And we want to treat it professionally, you know. We're not like a punk band that, you know, can just be sloppy and, you know, there's got to be a certain amount of precision yeah. to what we do. So you have to put the, that effort in. But really, I feel like, you know, just sitting there learning paradiddles or, you know, working out a solo. I'm never going to do a drum solo. And as far as I'm concerned, drum solos don't really happen in reggae music. Anyway, yeah. I've seen loads of reggae artists. can't remember seeing one drum solo, you know, and they're really, really boring. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not bothered about it. I, I wanted to get together with my friends, my fellow yeah. musicians, so play together. That's how we're going to get tight. I get that. It's more of a vibe thing. It's more of a pleasure because like, it's, it's always fun to ask an, a musician, like where you know, at a certain point in their career where they're like, I can just put my my instrument down and go back to it and pick it up without losing anything. I need the break. And some artists are like, No, I can't do it. I will literally lose lose my mojo if I don't play it for a few weeks. You know what I'm saying? So it's always interesting to hear how each artist approaches their instrument between a break. And then COVID was kind of weird for everybody. Yeah, yeah, COVID. We, we, I mean, we. To be honest, I love lockdown. Really enjoyed lockdown. Really be, enjoyed being home with my family, and you know, I had a fabulous time. Uh, getting into the second year, my wife started to say, "Aren't you due to go on tour at some point?" You know? I was gonna say, "Is your family uh, feel the same way about you being home though?" Like every all the musicians were like, "I'm home." And the families are like, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." Exactly. I mean, it's great when I come home because I mean, it's worked for me and my wife. You know, we got together before the band started, so yeah. it's kind of worked for us over the years. But yeah, there comes a point where she goes, "Aren't you supposed to be away <laughs> now, uh, uh, doing, doing working?" So you know, uh, I, I, it's the best of, of all worlds. You know, when you you go away, you look forward to coming home, and then when you're home, you want to go away. But lockdown definitely the second year. It was um, getting harder and harder, mostly for the people around me rather than me. I, yeah, I, I right. Like doing nothing. Uh, yeah, well, I enjoy doing nothing, you know, so uh, it's it's one of those things. But yeah, um, but we, we, we've come back with a vengeance. And since we've been back, which was nearly two and a half years after we yeah. shut down for COVID, you know, um, it, we, you know, we've worked really hard. You know, we've already been to the States. We were in Australia and New Zealand earlier on in uh, January. You know, we're coming back to the States again in July. Uh, in the meantime, we're playing British States and we're doing the Albert Hall. This is all a celebration of our 45th year. So uh, we've been really busy since, so we're very happy with that. Well, I think and I think the fans, the hardcore fans, always appreciate a working band. 
you, you always get respect from me you know, working on the road non-rock star you know what i mean just just working you know soldiers for soldiers you know and, and i think that the fact that people can still see you and you guys still sound so good i, I have you know see you in person but like even on youtube you can clips on youtube that you're streaming events you guys sound so good and I, again i think it shows that you you practice and get prepared real hard before the show in the rehearsals yeah. so by the time you're on the stage it seems like it's effortless and it's very smooth the because the music of you before you kind of kind of uh envelops a room and it's very smooth you know what i mean to me it feels yeah. very warm and it's very it's it, it's more of just a sound it's like it is it, to me it's like a the musical vibe and just feels it's a it's emotion and uh well that's you, you know when you're um when you're uh when you're on stage, you want to be as well rehearsed as possible because then you can relax and enjoy yeah. what you're doing. And we have a great time. We come off every night, you know, and this isn't really isn't an exaggeration. We come off high every night where we've had a great time, where we made we've uplifted people, you know, which is mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful things you can do, isn't it? You know, and then get paid for it as well. And you're right, we're it kind doesn't of suck. old fashioned we're old fashioned troubadours, you know. We we, we that's how we make our living. We turn up to a new town, set up, play, break it down, go on to the next one. You know, that's the life we've lived for 45 years, you know, and uh, I love it. I think people don't realize, and a couple of things with musicians, A, you know, doing something right and feeling good can give you that instant high and that great, and that's what actually probably a lot of musicians down that dark road because they all want to keep catching that feeling. But But one of the things with a musician is, I think, and it makes it even more enjoyable is when you keep having these, because you practice, you keep having these great nights. Because I think a lot of musicians feel like they're like a boxer. You're only as good as your last fight. The fans might have the album and say, that's ah, a platinum album. They're always good and not hear you from you for 10 years. You, you're a bad kid. You're like, I got to make it up the next night. Because you're, you're like, it's like, it's like the boxer mentality. You want to always be the, be the champ every performance. You know, it's, it's a little different. So, so at this point, for you to perform at that level, it's got to feel good. Oh, it feels brilliant. Yeah, what can I say? And with people that, you know, we instinctively know each other. We like playing together. Uh, apart from, you know, a few changes, it's the same right. um, lineup that we've had for at least 30 years. So, you know, we, well, like I said before, we genuinely like each other. We like to spend time together, you know. We're a little bit like, you know, if you go to like a social club and there's a bunch of old guys in the corner playing dominoes yeah. or or cards or something you know that's us we 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 enjoy being together you know and we we don't actually want to be interrupted if you see what i mean <laughs> you know we like being on the bus we like being in the dressing room you know we we like the banter between everybody and you know and it's very empowering to be part of something where nine ten people are all working towards the one you know the, the one outcome which is a great gig yeah. and that's not even including the crew and you know all the people that work behind the scenes you know you've got 25 30 people all working towards this one thing which is the two hour show or the hour and a half show that we yep. do and it's empowering to be part of that i love being part of it is it is it hard now for you to do songs like because you have so many albums and original songs i think like you guys obviously like labor love you, you guys are known big songs for like a lot of your covers but you guys have mm -hmm just you have a ton of really good music anybody just you know all the albums are good you know and a ton of solid songs you could you do four-year albums like if you just put it in and go top to bottom if you don't know the title of it you can just listen to it and you're going to enjoy it you know you're not going to find a bad one in the bunch so it's got to be hard as a musician to be like i had a hit with this original uh, with this you know cover song i've got a lot of good i've got a lot of original songs i'd like to play too is it kind of a challenge sure. to find a balance because you have well, that's, you have that's hardcore exactly fans, what... and then you have the people at the fans at the festival that maybe know Red Red Wine, yeah. and maybe know two, th two or three songs. And you have a smattering of fans that you gotta want to keep everybody happy. And you're mm -hmm. doing tours so but much. We... How do you approach that? Well, we, um, yeah, we like I said, we 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 like to include our own music as well. You know, we like to do a deep dive into the, you know, into the the back catalog uh, when we yeah. can. Um, you're right about festivals obviously the, the the sets tend to be shorter on festivals you know we're, we're playing an hour this weekend and uh it's going to be mostly hits but we're still going to be squeezing in two or three um generally unknown numbers and original numbers um uh, and we you know that's down to us selling the song you know selling the number we've got to perform it well and if we do then people appreciate it you know and they don't get bored but obviously I, I... we we tie 
but I respect that. I love it. I think it shows so much, um, so much power, so much confidence. I mean, uh, the, the, the big rock tour, Def Leppard was, uh, on tour, they came out and did, did an, an original, a new song, new single. They opened up as a headlining band in a stadium a new, with a new single, which is awesome for a band to do. You guys doing yeah. like stuff like that. It's important for bands to keep putting in stuff that people don't know. I'm applauding all yeah, types yeah. of music. I'm thinking like, yeah, you guys did something that it's a new song. You're not just doing a hit. You're doing. I love that. It's it's gotta be exciting as a musician to keep challenging yourself. You know. Yeah. Well, when we I mean, last time we did um, uh, did a tour in the states when we did Hollywood Bowl, um, we were playing four or five numbers in a row in the middle of the set that we we knew were completely unknown to the audience. You know, and I think we indulged ourselves a little with that. But because we've got so many hits. We can strategically place those yeah. hits. So if we've lost them, we can get them back, you know, with, uh, you know, Here I Am Baby or The Way You Do The Things You Do, right. Homely Girl, you know, Red Red Wine, Kings and Town, Can't Up Falling In Love, you know, all these tunes that people expect to hear when they come to the show. We can strategically put those in a set knowing the effect that they're going to have. And, and that means we can indulge ourselves a little bit, which is what we enjoy doing. You know, we like to put yeah. uh, dub sections in. So it's just instrumental, you know, atmospheric sort of dub sections into, into tunes. And that's, that's what, that stuff is important to us. We don't just want to do, you know, like a karaoke. Let's do well, that's, that's, and, that's, 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 that's hard for a band with, like you, because you guys have so many hits. And as a performer, you know, you're, they're expected to play it, but you're still writing music, which makes it hard for you to, you're at a point now where you guys could do a couple nights. Like you could do your anniversary show and do like three nights at some place and just like do the deep dives, do the specials. Like each night you could do something different. Like some bands are doing now because it would be a treat. You guys have so much fantastic, you know, material and such a strong fan yeah, base. We did, we, um, we did actually a few years, just after uh, Ali had left, we we actually toured our first album, Signing Off, which is probably not very well known in America. But, uh, I mean, I suppose we could tour the Labour of Love one in the States, you know. But we, we, we toured the album. We played the album from start to finish. And uh, fun. then we had a break, and then we came back on and played um, some of the hits, you know. I mean, I remember somebody saying that they were in the toilet in the at the gig, you know, just a fan that we were communicating with. And they said that somebody said, they heard somebody say, well, they'd been on for an hour. And I don't really, I haven't recognised any songs that <laughs> they played. That's because we were playing our first album to start with and then doing the, you know, the hits in the second half of the show, you know, which we, we can do. But yeah, I mean, we, we I'd love to do the more experimental things. And uh, yeah, we, we we may well do our second album present arms. We might tour that as well. Or anything, yeah, any kind of like special like thing where you guys camp out for a couple of days and every night you do something different, an album or a this mm -hmm. or a jam or other specials. I mean, because you guys have such a catalog. I, I'm sure you guys would have a, no problem putting putting people in the seats. It would, you know, as a band, it'd be we, fun. Yeah, we've recorded 500 tunes. So over 500 tunes. Holy so. moly. Holy moly. That's, that, that's about a, a month. <laughs> Of three hours a night. Yeah. That's insane. I mean, so at this point, so how are you even approaching? Right? I mean, I, you guys are still doing new music. Mm -hmm. So at, at this point, besides touring, I, I assume at some point you're going to want to sit down and start doing more music again. Is it, how do you even decide you write these new songs and then what's going to go back into the, the catalog to play? Because you, you guys gave and play some of your favorite ones from the last album. Or the ones the no, nineteen before that, or the one nineteen before that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we do. We tend to sort of like gather tracks as we go along. We work out from each album which are the tracks that were live, and sometimes you can't know that until you right. actually play them in front of the audience. You know, you can imagine how things were, but you've really got to get there and do it. And certain tunes catch fire even when they're unknown. You know, so we'll keep that in the set, and then the next album we'll work out which one is the the good live track from that. And we yeah. kind of accumulate these sort of not hits, but, you know, right. big, live, big live tunes. Yeah, great live tunes. So, you know, we, we, we try to keep that balance between the two. You hear a lot of bands will say like, you know, well, before the days of all the recording, the bands would write their songs and go on tour for a couple of weeks. 
to really get the songs fleshed out, figure out what the songs are. Nowadays, a band can't do that because if you're roughing on a song, there's an audience recording it. It's on YouTube before you guys get to the, the backstage area. <laughs> Yeah. And your song's not yeah. perfect yet. Because that's but you know, yeah. in a way, in a way, it kind of plays into our hands because um obviously the music business had changed and records don't sell anything like as much as they used to, with right. people streaming and pirating, and that's really reduced the amount of records. But then in the end, you know, people don't want to pay for for records, but I'm not surprised really, because anybody can make a record with a couple right. of hundred dollars worth of equipment in your bedroom you can make a great sounding record you know um but you can't always get up on on stage live and right. and and reproduce that record and that's where we we are now the only way that we survive financially is because we we play live live gigs because that's bums on seats and people buying tickets you know yeah. uh, uh, otherwise you, you, you your music but i understand that it's kind of worthless you know because it's throwaway pop you know, which is a different thing to being a live performer, you know. Right. And it, you know, there are different sides, but it's hard because as a live band, you know, there's also the merch side. And unfortunately, you know, and then a lot of the venues are going after the merch now because they realize that's the the, the other the last chance for money, you know, sit the band up on the merch percentage, you know, which hurts, hurts a band, you know. You know yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's the yeah, band. I love I, I think a lot of bands as well, they're doing what they call 360 deals with with yeah. the record companies, where the record company get a share of everything, all the live work, all the merchandising, the records, and we refuse to do that. We're not going to do that, you know. No. I mean, just like a lot of artists now uh, selling their streaming rights, you know, there's a, a lot of, you know, we've been offered a few million to sell, our, sell 50% of our streaming rights, but we're yeah. not going to do it. We refuse to do it because that's got value, you know, and that's got value to the musicians, not to some, you know, uh, hedge fund or, you know, that's, that's buying up back catalogues, you know what I mean? So we're sticking with it. We're going, well, if you're going to give us so, that much money for 50% of our streaming rights, we're going to keep it because we're going, if, you, if, if you think that's going to make money, we're going to keep it. So, you know, fuck off. Right. Basically. I just Excuse think at this point, there's a certain point of money, also with money, if you, if you can't make enough money, you want to keep control of your music if you can anyhow. I mean, that's, you're an artist. I mean, you know, once you lose control of it, it's going to end up on a commercial for a car or something. And man, if I was an artist and I did that and I was still alive, I'd be like, that's not what I wanted to happen to my music. But like, you know what I'm saying? There's certain things you don't want to do to your music unless you want to do it. And that's cool. But a lot of artists fight so hard to not be a commercial. And then yeah. at this part of their career, they sell it. Next thing you know, I'm not going to say a car brand, but you may have heard, a, you know, like a Led Zeppelin song on a Mercedes or whatever. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, you're like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. And it's their, it's their song. It's their, their tune. But you know what I'm saying? Like a band fights for it, fights against it so long. And the next thing you know. Yeah, I think, I think for us, you know, we're not really an aspirational band in that way. You know, we don't represent aspiration in that way to own a sports car or you know to have this and to have that and you know we're not that kind of band you know we're a blue collar band you know and our audience tends to be uh, it, certainly in most uh, countries in the world tends to be a blue collar audience you know right, and, we, right. we, and we're not you know it wouldn't be suitable for us to be using that i mean you might get away with using red red wine in a wine video i was going to say that, like that would be about the, exactly but but if you think about it, you guys have also had been so many you guys have made so many great political statements and very blue collar. So you know what I mean? You already made so many great statements to, with your music about it. It stands for a lot of really good things. Besides fun, it's got a lot of good things behind it, especially your original stuff. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we you know we, we we when we write our own material and let's face it, we've only done I think we've done four Labor of Love cover version albums and we, yet we've done 25 26 studio albums and all the other albums apart from those cover version albums i have self-written and we're just as political now as we used to be although i must admit it's it's hard to find a, a new way of writing about class war you know yeah. which is basically what, what the what the basic um you know subjects of most of our political songs are you know it's it's about rich against poor and you know, uh, it gets harder to find an angle 
for the same subject, if you see what I mean. But, you know, we still do because we're still political, you know, and we're still as strongly political as we've always been, if not more. Oh, and it's important. Times keep changing, but it's still important to keep, you know, saying these things and letting people relate to them. It's got to be, you know, fresh and challenging. It, but do you yeah, think it's... I, yeah. I was, I was just going to say, I like, I like, you know, when I hear it from other people, it's kind of good for your sanity to, you know, I feel this way, and then somebody else does something showing they feel that way too. Mm. And I think, you know, it makes you feel, you know, when I see Bernie Sanders, I think to myself, I'm not going mad. It is yeah. that simple, you know. And I think, I think people need that, you know. And and if we can, if we can give that, then that's a great thing. Yeah. Totally, I think you know, and and at this point in your life, I mean, you've had success and you've challenged, and life goes on. But if you look back, there's still going to be political struggles. Always going to be things you need to do. I think one of the things with me is I always think, and I would say it's frustrating. It's kind of, but I do think it's kind of a bummer. I don't think you guys get the proper props because you guys get lumped into all your covers, which is good because success is awesome. But I think it glosses over to a big part of the world because let's face it, the world likes hit singles and they don't deep dive like a lot of people like a lot of musicians or fans do and it takes away from a lot of people who just have no idea you know the content and the things you guys have written about yeah no i'm sure and yeah my but i'm not that doesn't bother me you know i mean uh, we we tend to like moan and groan when it's about when we've got to do reggae wine again you know in rehearsal and go oh well, do we really have to play it we know how we play you know and it's yeah, when we get it in front of audience you know it's a completely different thing then you get a vibe from it you know so uh I, i'm not knocking that that success and those cover versions no, no, I'm, I'm just it. saying unfortunately you can't be you're not known as strongly like the, the duality of both of them of being political and having the fun songs you more yeah. a lot more people know the fun songs and don't realize oh, oh my god if you just like peel back the cover a little bit there's a lot more underneath the engine of this car you yeah. know what i mean yeah. uh, that, that's all i'm saying that. Exactly. Know that, you know, well, as so, a fan, I'm saying, it, me, I wish more people were aware of that. Uh -huh. Really smart lyrics and really, you know, challenging topics are also in yeah, there. That's, without that's being, the without being, and without being downtrodden, there's still a good rhythm, and it's still kind of, it's, it's like, uh, it's like inspiring to kind of keep going uh -huh. and not, not, not what was me. Yeah, you know, but it is a bit. I mean, obviously, it, it, it's a bit frustrating, you know, when you think. In the last few years, we almost had a world where Bernie Sanders was president of the United States and Jeremy Corbyn was prime minister uh, of, of Great Britain. And that would have been a beautiful and different world. And it was so close, you know, but it's gone. You know, people, idiots decided they wanted Trump and Boris Johnson instead. They're idiots. And in England, they know they're idiots. I don't think in America they quite... Worked America, out. Is, um, America is, is divided on it, and mm -hmm. and I try to avoid putting my opinions on it because I just get frustrated talking to anybody. To me, at this point, I feel the world is on fire, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, just, and it's, it breaks my heart that there is so many people are so. Oh, it's awful. You yeah, know? I mean, I, I I totally agree with what you're saying, and oh. I'm just so lucky to be inside a, a social circle that understands that understands that it's cyclical there's no end point where you win that it you just it's a struggle that keeps going on and on against the forces of the right you know and uh sometimes you you make gains and then other times you make losses and you know like i said we got a world with donald trump and boris johnson you know two people obviously incapable of doing the job you know, uh, and that's where we are, and that's where it's not going to change in my lifetime. I'll die before I, I get some kind of leader that I have respect for. I don't think much of Biden either. You know, so I, I'm not expecting that to change anytime soon. I miss Abraham Lincoln. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, when it comes to British politics, I miss Clement Attlee because he was the post-war. A uh, British Prime Minister who built the national health system and built um, social housing for the soldiers coming back from from the war, and that's that was a very proud moment 
in the labour movement and unfortunately the labour movement as well as the left wing in you know the democrats in america have become center right now they're not center left in it well, yeah. at all I, I think what happened is and i'm actually not affiliated i'm more of a, a not not either of the parties because i like to vote for who i like and what individually so i'm not like in either of the parties actually and i and, and um but I think what's awful, and same thing with your country and most countries, is it's now just become just two groups, just like two football teams and fans of football teams or soccer or whatever we want to call it. And it becomes more about just the group getting mad at the other group. Hmm. And it becomes more of that. And everyone's just forgetting about everything else. You know, it's to not be honest, a... I, I think it's kind of worse in America because I think it really is split. But I think in England, despite the, the fact that our press is owned by right-wing billionaires most of the people in the country the overwhelming majority are progressive and decent and reasonable mm -hmm. people who uh you know want to live and let live and uh, and i think I, I think that is a majority you know a 60 70 percent majority yeah. but unfortunately the people that you know the, the the left as it's represented just splits it all up and you know, it never, never seems to beat the right because even though you can put all those votes that the left got together, and they would be much bigger than what the right wing got, but they they get across three or four different parties. You know, yeah. so but they're I there. Think, you know, it, you know, it's there. It's hope. I'm hopeful. Maybe I don't know. It's you're right in America right now. It's pretty much split down the middle, and it's yeah. not even like it's a discussion anymore. It's scary because everybody's just so angry and violent towards each other. And it's not, you can have two groups of two different opinions, but the fact that nobody's listening and everybody's just getting so crazy, it just makes it scary for everybody, you know? Yeah. There's no, well, I mean, there's we're no... Talking, sorry, but, you know, we're talking the right wing here, you know, we're talking the ascendancy right. of, you know, which, um, which I wouldn't have believed 20 years ago that we'd be where we are now. Um, but so, you know, it isn't six of one and half a dozen of the other, really. You know, right. it's the, the reactionary right wing that are, get, are in the ascendancy inside the corridors of power, you know, while most of us sitting on the outside just want to live a decent life and bring up our kids, you know, and 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 not mess with anybody and have a decent time, you know. Yeah. That's that's how most people are. They're family people, you know. And I think that's why a lot of us go towards the arts and music and stuff because, you know. You see, this is, the real world is, you know, if you really look at it, the, the, a big hunk of the real world and the people is like an audience at a festival. It's mixed, it's diverse, different ages and groups and genders and everybody loves each other. Some people are rude, some people aren't. But for the most part, that's more like with the world and how people get along than in any of these political parties anywhere. That's kind of the core of what the human race is like, you know? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants well, anything. Everybody wants to work. Everyone wants to work together and just respect each other. I remember the 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 massive march we had in England. Over a million people turned up on the eve uh, of the Iraq invasion by um, George Bush and uh, Tony Blair. And I I looked around. You know, this was million and a half people, which is for England, which is a small country compared to America. That's a lot of people to come out. I'm gonna be like, yeah, you guys have that many people there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. Exactly. It's a joke. I know. I know. It's a joke. Yeah, no. <laughs> but I, I looked around, you know, and it was young people, it was old people, it was middle class people, it was working class people, it was homeless, it was nurses, it was teachers, it was black, it was white, it was brown, it was every. This was the England or the Britain that I love, and yeah. they were there, you know, they're there. But when it gets fragmented, and when you look at the media, especially. You know, you would have a completely different idea of what England was like, you know, and especially when you look at our leaders, you'd be absolutely appalled thinking they were most dreadful people, but we're not, you know, we're really quite great. Well, I think most people are aware of the same thing. If you look at the politics, you look over here at the US, it's the same thing. No one's like mm -hmm. that. You know what I mean? There's, there's, it's usually the loudest ones at the party are making the most noise. There's only a handful of people and everyone else is kind of quiet, totally different. And I think, was, I think all of us know that in every country, it's like that pretty much, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, that's just how things are. I mean, the biggest crowds you guys are gonna get now is for what the uh, the inauguration there. You know, that's where the biggest crowds you're gonna get. You know what I mean? But just with uh, 
the king there. Like, I think that was the biggest crowd oh. you're going to get from. Well, People I, like I that. don't know about that. Actually, I think that the 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 crowd, the the demonstration against the Iraq War, probably pulled a lot more people. A million. No, I mean since then. I mean since. I mean nowadays though. Nowadays, getting that many people together. As I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it wasn't that long ago? You know, uh, there may be something that rallies people, like the I way so. that the Iraq War did. Yeah. I hope I'm so. always hopeful. We're all always hopeful. You never know, do you? If you can see that many people can come out to see somebody, you know, do the royal thing, I'd hope that there's something else that's more exciting that you want to get out and stand up for. <laughs> you well, know? I got and, I got thrown off Facebook by for saying fuck the king, which um, excuse me for swearing again. Uh, I suppose you'll have to bleep that out, but you know, unless we're live, in which case I'm really sorry. No, it's, I don't. Uh, I definitely even don't bleep it out. I just leave it. It's it is what it is. You are who you are. I'm not going to change it. You know, those are your opinions, and I. I, 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 you know what it is? I feel like to me, it's, I, it feels like it's just too much for me. But it's not my country. It's not my thing to say to have an opinion out publicly. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I haven't lived in it. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm entitled to have an opinion. Being, I believe. Well, I'll tell you what, though. It was in the, it was, yeah. it was in the rain, and there's nobody I would stand in the rain for. <laughs> and actually, no, I don't like, yeah. and I don't like large crowds of people either, though. So I probably there's like so many reasons besides just the, the, the royal family part that I wouldn't have been there. Just, you know, I didn't see I mean, one hot dog vendor. No, no euros being sold. I didn't see anything. That kind of event. I, 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 I think the French had the right idea back in the French Revolution <laughs> and just got rid, of, got rid of the aristocracy completely. And I think that's the only way forward, you know. I mean, we have such inherited wealth in England, inherited through families over centuries, you know, who've got this massive wealth, you know, even in their... Um, the Industrial Revolution, you know, it was the, the landowners that made the most money, even though it was all, you know, the, it was created by people with their hands, engineers and right. working people. And they, the, the landowners, they owned the land and they got the, the largest amount of money uh, for it. And it still happens today. And personally, like I said, if, I, I, I think the French had the right idea and just get rid of all of them. I don't think that's going to happen nowadays like that. I think... No, it's not. I, I don't think so. <laughs> we, we know yeah. it's the way the world is going on. It'd be interesting to, to take a look back in four more years and see where we're at after this. Now that COVID's over and people are really back to doing stuff, we'll see. We'll see what happens with politics and people. What people really want, you know. I think, well, and, and I think it's yeah. what I'm not. Expecting, I'm not expecting a big change. To be honest, no. in my lifetime, you know, I've got what another fifteen years if I'm lucky. You know, so I I don't see it changing. Because they've got such a grip on power, you know, the 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 right wing have and the establishment have and you know. I mean Trump is just a perfect example. I mean, I know he's not well, he wasn't popular with other people in the establishment, but really he's still an establishment man. He's still about inherited wealth. And yeah. you know, he's still about the power of the wealthy. And all this talk of him having of having blue collar people voting for him, they're just fools. Who believe is you know his stick, which I, I think is appalling. Well, I think that I think you know I even think the voting systems most everywhere are are not really relating to the people either. The parties, everything is it's just a nightmare. You know, having people yeah. represent you, you vote for people that represent you when it doesn't actually represent the real the real vote. Like in America, there's like two different votes, and you know the popular and the other votes. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, there's so so many things that are so silly. I mean. Um, and then, and then how the world got so divided over, you know, during COVID, I think at this point, thank God for, for, for music for me, because I would have gone crazy. You know, mm -hmm. that's where the well, show came from. You well, know that what I mean? It, it, thing, really, is that right? Well, that was another thing about um, COVID. I really loved it when traffic stopped and, you know, the air cleared and you could hear the birds singing and, you know, yeah. people weren't living that rat race and going around that hamster wheel. And I thought at that point, people were talking about, we could make this, a we could change the world here with this, you know, that mm -hmm. people working, working, going into the cities and working at home and, you know, and all all, all kinds of different changes that, you know, to me, it was beautiful. I, I, walking out on the street without all that traffic and, you know, it was a beautiful thing, but it was just short yeah. lived. Oh, I actually ended up having to, I was one of the few people I know that actually had to go into work still for my, for my, uh, I do computers. 
And, um, but no one else was there. So I would drive to work like into a city or go somewhere. And it was like a ghost town. I was going to say, it's like a ghost town, yeah. You could park anywhere and there was really nobody out there because I was special, you know, on a special list because I have to do certain things. That you need. I was, you know, like necessity people. So, you know, of people that would, your company that would go in sight to be me and like two other people, I have you know, hundreds and thousands of people because you're IT. So that was a real weird world that also everybody comes back now. Everything is just so crowded. Like, it, <laughs> you know Absolutely, what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not that I'm saying, you know, I'm not a great believer in sort of the concept of overpopulation. I think there's just bad distribution of wealth rather than uh, overpopulation, if you see what I mean. I think there's something kind of middle class about not wanting the lower classes to breed, you know, which is what the people who talk about, oh, we must restrict the population, you know, that it's something slightly eugenics about it where mm -hmm. you restrict the population to improve the stock, you know, and I don't believe in that. I don't think it works that way. I think there's just really bad distribution of wealth. And, you know, if somebody like Bernie Sanders would, would get into power, I would hope that he would, you know, redistribute the wealth as he should, you know, and that's exactly what we need to do. I don't see anybody giving up their wealth. No, I don't money. see it. Yeah. yeah. It's I so mean, crazy. It? Go on. But, 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 but compared to us, us compared to other people, we have, we you know, is middle class, whatever, and then, you know, where the finances are. Other people, we, we have way more than them. It's like saying, you know, would you give up your money, would I give up my money to somebody else that has way less than I? You know what I'm saying? Who's going to start giving yeah. up all their money to be equal in some system? It's a big well, thing to get people to, to take cash out of their pockets and, and live differently. I think the problem with America, uh, and I, it's going to happen in England as well, is that you need universal benefits for the welfare state you need yeah. everybody to benefit because what you've got now is the middle class work paying for it and they don't get any benefit and it all goes to you know uh to poorer people and that builds up resentment whereas what should really happen is that the middle class should benefit from it as well you know with like with child maintenance money and and all those kind of things you know and education and you know this uh, the sign of a civilized country, I think, is when rich people use public transport. You know, that that's the sign that, right. that you live in a country where it's uh, and and certainly lots some places in in northern Europe. You know, Sweden, they've got some brilliant sort of social housing developments where you've got people of all incomes living side by side. It doesn't just because something is social housing doesn't mean it should be poor quality and it's right. good enough quality for rich people to want to live in it as well as poor people. And that's, you know, to me, a civilized country. The poverty in America is shocking. I remember being shocked when I first arrived there mm -hmm. to see the, 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 the disparate, you know, nature of, of how wealth is di distributed yeah. in America. And it's grinding poverty there really is, you know, and, uh, and how many rich people there are, it just doesn't make any sense. I would say to me being middle-class and the fact that my, taxes going to helping out people that are you know aren't 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 in the same spot as me i'm okay with that because i think yeah, i'm paying yeah. my i'm paying my bills i can take care of my kids and you're gonna take these other taxes from me and take care of other people who can't take care of their family and kids go for it i have no i'm very happy with you know i have gratitude mm -hmm. for what i have and if other people less than me get to get the other tax money i'd rather have them get the money um mm -hmm. you know because i couldn't take that from anybody it's you know and, and there are it's, it's quite a challenge right now I no. think um, you know from back in the back in the eighties with the uh, you know the Chicago school economists who who convinced uh, Reagan to bring in sort of neoliberal uh, policies regarding finance and you know and build the the shadow banking system and all that that was the starting gun of the latest sort of class war you know the, the, and poor people have got poorer you know even if they're working they're not getting you know, when you compare to how the, the 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 wealth of rich people has just ballooned out of proportion, and working people aren't getting enough even to pay the bills. You know, even though they're working, some people are working three jobs to try and pay the bills. You know, and 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 that's been a, a problem ever since. I I see that collapsing. I, I, yeah. Maybe not in my my lifetime, but you know, if if working people, you know, we've got the first generation now where then people are not going to, young kids are not going to be as 
which is their parents, not going to be as well off as their parents. And really that's breaking a, you know, a, a, like a bond. You know, working people are prepared to do shitty jobs if they think there's a better life for their children. But if they know that there isn't a better life for their children, then why are people doing shitty jobs, you know? And and, and I think that that, that kind of feeling will really grow, uh, you know? And I think that, I mean, the, the crash of 2008 was the end, really, of, mm -hmm. of that, you know, that massive financial crash with the um, subprime mortgages in America, but really helped by the city of London, you know, which is, you know, if you wanted to clean up the um, the, the fi global finance, you stick the tube in in Wall Street, you know, give the world an enema and stick the tube in Wall Street and stick the tube in the city of London and wash it all out, you know, and uh, well, we, we, we have a better life, you know. But if you, I mean, I think, and I'd say this, I think that, a lot of people have a, a, a view that this is a station where in its life and the only way you get rich is if you play the lottery or they're going to play, you know, I won't go and see an artist. I mean, I want artists to get paid and the productions are big and like you've got a crew behind you that didn't work for two years and I get the production stuff, but I'm not going to pay $500 for one ticket for Bruce Springsteen or an artist like that. I'm not going to pay, or like we, we used to uh, have um, athletes making such ridiculous amounts of money and a family is struggling to make things, but they wanted their one their one fun thing as a family is to go to a football game, and it's priced so much that they can't even take their family to a sport, and that's what you do for a living. There's a certain point with the value of money of these of what people are making, and 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 people in the education system aren't making anything, and they're using their own money to buy pencils for their students. I mean, mm -hmm. to me, that would be the first place I would adjust. I would adjust the economics from the education, and the teachers and the medical people for people, and then you know. You can be an athlete and a musician and make good money, but the numbers are so high and people pay that to them. So if somebody that has doesn't make a lot of money pays that money to support that system, why are they mm -hmm. going to change that system? Well, you know, we we we're called UB forty, and UB stands for unemployment. Yeah, benefits. Right. I, I was like that. Form forty, you know, and that means that we know that there's a lot of people out there that can't afford. We always want to keep our ticket prices as low as possible. You know, that's not because we're desperate to sell the tickets, you know, it's because we believe that, you know, most of our fans, like I said, we're a blue collar band, you know, we have blue collar fans. But there are, there, there are costs, there, there's unions, there are lights, I'm sorry, there are lights, there's unions, there's insurance, there's, there's a lot of expenses. A band should pull off a working wage too. And, and the, the crew should yeah. be able to take care of their family. So I get that whole profit thing. I'm talking about the crazy example a lot of rock bands are pushing back. I think, was it The Cure said, no, 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 you're not doing that to our tickets. A lot of bands are saying, no, we have a price and that's fine. You're not gonna, you can't go that far back. You know, Pearl Jam's famous for pushing back on that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? There's a certain point where- Really, yeah. You don't need to go that far for the prices on certain things. Your fans will come back every year. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're talking on, mm -hmm. on a music model, you as an artist, you can be smaller now and sell no albums or sell, you can sell, a hundred albums instead of spelling a thousand albums or reach a reach a hundred fans instead of a hundred thousand or ten thousand and you will make more money each year by being dedicated and realistically fight mm -hmm. that model i've seen that from the show working out now by being you know mm -hmm. priced decent for people and consistent as opposed to doing these crazy things and and it, and it allows your relationship to grow and he's you going and the fans going but you know $500 yeah, for a ticket, artists, to sit five, four, artists, five rows back to see somebody play. I'm like, ah, there's nobody I want to see for $500. It, it's profiteering, isn't it? Really, yeah, that's, that's what they yeah, do. It, it, profiteering. Yeah. And yeah, and, and even if the artist is the one yeah. making the money, it's still, it's, I'm saying with, with, with sports making that kind of money, you know, I just read a basketball player, if he retires, he's going to be retiring as a billionaire from playing basketball. I'm like, that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, we've got to work hard for it. It's not like they're sitting in an office or he's, you know, he's in a, you know, some some place in Wall Street <coughs> where they're, um, you know, at lunch making big deals. You know what I mean? These guys have to work and hard, work hard and sweat. I haven't really got a, a, a problem with, with sports people. It's usually the only way people, working class people, can ever make that kind right. of money. Apart from, like right. you say, winning the lottery. So I, I have nothing against, you know, football. It's the same with footballers. They get paid ridiculous money. But, you know, 
they work really hard for it. You know, I'm not, not, it's not, yeah, like, it's not about that. No, it's not about them taking it. If I was in that position and I was giving them money, oh, I would take it too. I'm not saying I wouldn't. Exactly. Not, right. What I'm saying is because it's it that system is so uneven, where mm-hmm. the value of this high here and somebody who may work two jobs works physically and mentally just as hard as that athlete makes money down here, mm-hmm. and then space then works hard takes that money to buy tickets or whatever for this thing. Just you know what mm-hmm. I'm saying. As long as that yeah. that that view is working, it's going to be the same. So because mm-hmm. everyone everyone feels like they have their their stations in life, and no one's no one's pushing out saying, you know what, this isn't my station. I I need to go up more. I, I I'm not going to yeah. do this. You know, and no one's going to do yeah. that, or or less people do that. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Like I said, you know, we I mean we don't really control our ticket prices everywhere. No. I'm sure, we probably don't with the states either. And because we're you know we're an imported band. It's probably more expensive to put an Asher one than it would be somebody who was living locally, for instance, you know. But even so, you know, certainly in England, we like to peg it. So, you know, I mean, it, it goes up, you know, we don't keep it all at, you know, £30, which is no. what we did for years. But it's only gone up to £40, you know. Yeah. No, no, no but I'm saying. Up- well, and I, I do talk about the economics of bands and this because this is a music show. I do talk about that, like, you know. If a band comes over from another country, they're looking at five to ten, you know, grand, uh, uh, you know, a person to come in. They're getting taxed. They're getting taxed. The shirts they bring the merchandise in, they get taxed bringing stuff in. Mm-hmm. Then, then the then the venues they get American tax on that on their merchandise. They pay tax in their own country, and then the venues probably taxing them on their merchandise too. That's like three taxes. That's mm-hmm. like the mob. So I mean, it's 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 a pretty insane. So yeah, especially foreign bands come over here. They do need to charge more just so they can break even sometimes. So it doesn't make any sense yeah, to not make any money. You know, it takes well, a couple shows just to break even. Yeah, we we're still waiting for a tax rebate from 2019 when we were, we were there. And it was, it due, it's been due for several years and we still haven't been paid it, you know. Uh, and that's another thing about the music business. You have to think ahead because you're not going to bring in money. You know, you might be spending money to make a record or do rehearsal, but you're not going to really pay that until you bring in the money later you know yeah. and very often that can be a long way you know uh with where you could sell records but you not don't get paid for those records until six months eight months later you know so you, you, have, you, to, off. you have to factor that into the music business you know well this is uh, yeah this is <laughs> this actually is a bonus talk this is a fun talk to have with you i didn't uh unplanned spontaneous little polo that was, that was fun it was good um i do i do want to remind people though to check you out there's not a lot of bands that are out there still doing it. Playing live. Yeah. The big controversy. No one's playing live. You guys are playing live. You're delivering it. See you when you're on the road. We saw what happens to COVID to bands. You know, go yeah. to the band live. Support the band. Get the merch. You know, avoid the other stuff. If you, can, you, you, you know, do it. On, you know, go, the website will be underneath this this show. Go, go to the site and buy the merch directly from them if you can. It's even better. Because there's no no one taking out the profits as much as you know being in a venue. It's less stuff to carry around. They can just sell directly. You know, you want to keep your bands going, and this is the time because the industry's gone belly up. So yeah, come and have come and have an uplifting experience and see a band that are, are uplifted themselves when they perform. And you know, you can't beat that. That's 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 you know that there's something very special about that live live thing you know and that's something we're really good at i think you know even if, if i blow my own trumpet you know uh it's something we've been doing for years and we know what we do we're not nervous we enjoy it and you know you have a, a fun experience when you come and see the band and uh yeah come along yeah it, and, and, and two hours of just smiling and not worrying about the world is really good for your soul too yeah, absolutely so, so they, they should take advantage of that and check it out Jimmy, I want to thank you for giving me some time today. It's been a, a real pleasure for me to, to chat yeah, with you. I think, I, I think I talked quite a lot. To it, that, it, it's, 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 a, it's a conversation. That's what these shows are about. It's not, I don't have an agenda. Really? I don't have any, I have nothing in front of me. I'm not that guy. I'm not the the bullet point guy. I want to mm. talk. I, I, want... I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun, even with the slight delay on the. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. There's a slight delay. We're so far yeah. away, you know, but but to that point, I mean, it is, it's a real talk, and that's what the world needs is more real talk, you know. So, uh, I thank I, you for, sh- for sharing your time with, with me and 
and the fans today. And uh, be looking forward to seeing you guys over in the States again. So Yeah, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you Thank soon. You. Thanks. Thank you.